Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the last in a series of discussions about the 2D barcode trial here at Case Western Reserve University. I'm Gary Winnick from the Department of Macromolecular Science and Engineering and TIME, the Institute for Management and Engineering, which I'll say a bit about in just a moment, but would like to welcome you uh, uh, to this uh, continuing series on a very exciting and uh, very instructive and beneficial trial. Uh, an overview of our panel discussion this afternoon is uh, centered on findings and implications of the trial. You heard from David Miller, CEO of Mobile Discovery, earlier about 2D barcodes uh, and uh, uh, the interest in Europe and Japan principally, and finally, emerging technology here in the U.S. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, students in the trenches who have helped mobile discovery through one of our courses at the Institute for Management and Engineering uh, ferret out voices of, the, of customers, uh, understanding strategic directions and positioning for the uh, technology. And we'll hear from three of our students who I'll introduce in a moment. And uh, they'll provide uh, first-hand user uh, experiences. We'll also hear from Michael Kenny, a professor of chemistry, on the use of this technology in a classroom setting that complements uh, nicely uh, the, uh, the trial uh, here at, uh, at CASE. Uh, me again, uh, the Institute for Management and Engineering, I, I, I will shamelessly take a moment to, uh, to talk about that. We run a master's uh, degree program called the Master of Engineering and Management. It is meant to prepare young engineers for careers in industry where they can hit the ground running uh, appreciating issues outside of technical details, including project management, product design, finance and accounting, and uh, topics like that. Uh, I have the privilege of co-teaching a course on product design and development, and David Miller, CEO and president of Mobile Discovery, approached us last fall about student teams helping the company uh, participate in this trial and, and uh, help uh, with strategic directions and growth for the company. Uh, one of the things that we pride ourselves on in the MEM program is experiential learning. Uh, people like myself and Stan Court, who was uh, moderator in the earlier session, he and I co-teach the product design course. Uh, we can lecture, uh, and we do, uh, as, as part of our uh, educational delivery, but it's really uh, rolling up your sleeves and, uh, and working the real deal, so to speak, and uh, this particular project was a perfect example of that, taking a nascent idea, uh, very fresh and unknown to this campus, and participating in a national uh, trial. So uh, we appreciated that opportunity very much. Uh, and we will hear from, uh, from three of our students. Uh, uh, we will hear from uh, Mike McHugh, uh, Ben Rose, and N.C. Obudu Takudo. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I think I got that right. Uh, we just call him NC for, uh, uh, his friends call him NC, and we're among his friends, so uh, <laughs> appreciate that a lot. David Miller, as I mentioned, CEO and president of Mobile Discovery. And last, we'll hear from Michael Kenny, uh, professor of chemistry, on uh, using this technology in the classroom in a very innovative, innovative way. <clears throat> so we'll first turn the discussion to, uh, to David, uh, talking about the findings from the trial, uh, which, uh, the, pl the planning stages really began back in the fall, but the trial itself uh, began in early February, and much has been done, much has been learned in just a few short months. So I can very clearly remember the day that I came to Gary's class, and uh, along with, what was it, four other companies presented uh, to, the, to the students and uh, was hoping that we would get some interest uh, in this trial. And uh, I was very pleased when Gary called me later that day or that week and said, well, we, we have uh, five uh, companies that, that are here to, uh, to, to do this cooperative learning experience. And we had three student teams want to work on your trial. 
I couldn't have been happier with the level of interest and, and the, the quality uh, of the students that, that we had working uh, hand in hand with Mobile Discovery on this trial. So that, that, was, that was a really uh, a wonderful opportunity. Uh, the, the trial did start um, going back almost a year. It was last summer when I made my first trip up to campus working with uh, some folks in ITS that led to the introduction to the to the time uh, and the MEM program, and uh, you know, like any new product launch, there's a lot of work that goes on before the product hits the street, and uh, this trial really helps uh, represent that. We um, there was a lot of planning, a lot of organization, a lot of education uh, that that led up to this, and the end result is if you look around the room. You see all the different use cases, uh, and this is just a sampling. There, there are more that didn't make it to what we call this museum here. But these are the use cases that uh, students had to interact with uh, on campus. So when, when we get to uh, learnings and, and findings, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to report that we had 23% of our targeted population uh, participating in this trial with us. We targeted uh, the undergrad uh, group and certain uh, grad programs as well. Uh, we did it through info sessions and uh, banners and uh, um, napkins in the dining halls and uh, all sorts of innovative uh, ways uh, to do outreach. And um, we, we allow the students to play a dual role. And this is a very important thing to understand for this trial. Uh, because codes, you can either act as a consumer and you're the one who walks up and you scan a code and you participate in some sort of an interaction. Or you can be a code producer. And the code producer is generally the advertiser. Uh, who you know designs ads and, and stuff like this, but with this trial, the student population had the ability to play both roles. So they could access our portal just like an advertiser and go through and create codes, build mobile content, uh, build a, a, a marketing campaign, and uh, um, that greatly uh, helped with the codes that, that made their way to campus. And QVC actually designed their promotional campaign with that in mind. And the, the QVC campaign was, it's called Make It or Break It. And the Make It has to do with the students having the opportunity to create code-enabled ads and have friends uh, and folks around campus scan it. So it was that capability that led to uh, 806 unique code-enabled use cases that were implemented around campus. Um, which we were very pleased to have that much activity on the code creation or the code producer side. Uh, as far as code scanned, uh, our, our biggest week, we in the midst of the QVC trial, we had over 3,000 scans in one week. Um, and uh, on one, one, day, one day in particular, uh, 1,000 scans. And that, those are numbers that uh, we're very proud of. And, and it's the result of promotional work that was done by this student team up here, as well as folks from Mobile Discovery, and leveraging all of the assets here at the university. So I mentioned uh, you know, the napkins. We had posters up around campus. We leveraged uh, Case Daily, which is a, a newsletter that goes out every day. We leveraged the, key, uh, the Case Observer, which is the newspaper. And if you haven't seen it already, we've got multiple copies of it back uh, in the corner of the room there. So we l And finally, we leveraged um, digital displays that are in various buildings around school, which was uh, the use case showed that this is not just a technology for traditional print medium, but it can extend into digital uh, mediums as well. Uh, so, so those are the ways we, we created the outreach. Uh, through the survey that I discussed in an earlier panel, we had over 80% of the folks were responding that they see value in this sort of technology. Um, and uh, ease of use is something that we always strive for as well. And this survey told us that 87% of the users uh, thought the platform was user friendly. That's my part of this. And uh, the real meat and potatoes of this presentation is going to come from the rest of the folks here. So I'm happy to pass the mic on to NC. Thank you very much. Um, so. By the way, my name is NC Obo Tetsukudo. He had it. We were still practicing. We're gonna we're gonna get it better. Um, so, 
the biggest thing that I learned um, by participating in said, this, this launch of, of uh, codes on campus was primarily on a point of uh, collaboration and trying to find opportunities of interoperability. And when I say that, it's more or less speaking to, speaking to the different facets that are on campus and trying to take this new technology and embed those things that are on campus. And for instance, one of our, one of our prime examples was the, uh, the Observer. And we tried to, um, we tried to, we tried to infuse the codes into the, into the paper such that it, it brought the paper to a higher level of um, readability and even access to information that was in the paper itself. I mean, that whole entire enterprise as, the project, as one of the project managers um, managing the, the students who were working on it, that whole entire enterprise required a lot of uh, work with um, the folks of the observer, as well as trying to try to get a better idea as to what their design intent was, and try to get a better idea as to what their true motivation was, and in trying to implement this new technology, I think that for me it was important to understand what the end user really wanted to get out of life, wanted to get out of whatever it is they're using, and how our new technology can make that better, and how our new technology can make that uh, even stronger than what they even thought it, um, was possible. So. Um, you know, um, my my name means with my name means anything is possible, and with that you have to think about uh, imbuing everything with 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 the with the with the highest level of possibility and trying to expand it to a highest level of creativity and um, what's what's the word? Just this. Uh, Oh, greatness. <laughs> Not to say that I'm great or anything like that, but, but that, that things you should work on is to try to be as impacting as possible. And I think that when you try to implement a new technology, there are, there are obstacles, and a lot of times there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of hurdles in your way, but in working on this project, it was clear that any obstacle can be overcome, so anything is possible, especially when it comes to working with people who want to try to get this out and working with ideas that are... Um, that are you know robust and as robust as as codes can be, so that's my my general takeaway. What we have in the back is a, a number of uh, posters that reflect the evolution of, of ads and re the evolution of articles, ev evolution of just media in general. Um, it's really like a three-step process where you have the original code, I mean the original article, and you have a code that's imprinted onto it, and then what it connects, what, what that code connects uh, the user to. The, the idea that we wanted to kind of show with this was that um, anything can really be enhanced with the code, and that by adding a code to some some media platform or some some piece of content, you're really evolving that content. Um, one thing that we thought of the other day was. Um, or one thing someone said to me the other day was, uh, a picture speaks, a picture has, speaks a thousand words. If that's the case, a code speaks volumes more. Because you can really just add the code to it and attach it to a number of other pictures, attach it to a number of other uh, items. That's really what the, the evolution was supposed to show and what the museum tried to embody. I'd like to uh, call on Mike McHugh, one of our MEM students who uh, participated in the product development team. Um, with mobile discovery to uh, talk about his favorite use case. Yeah, thank you. I was um, one of the product managers of this project, and what that essentially meant was that each product manager kind of ran and managed a use case, kind of set everything up, was there hands-on, helping it along the way. Um, so that being said, as you can see in the back, there's a number of use cases that we ended up utilizing. Um, some came up as you know, new ideas throughout the project that we hadn't even planned on doing. So it was very, um, it was very fun and innovative and kind of changed as, as we went along. That being said, um, I'll just list off a few of the major ones that we did. There was the, the Greeny bus shuttles, the, as we said, the Observer, the Q Code Make It or Break It campaign, the Magazine Drive, and uh, the Relay for Life event, and also the Facebook applications. and. I was actually in charge of the Facebook, so it would probably be easiest for me to pick that as my favorite, but um, I'll refrain from doing so. And from the actual experience aspect, I would say the Q code was my favorite and what it brought to the students. I thought that, you know, through, we teamed with QVC and had this grand sweepstakes, as uh, David mentioned briefly, and what, what it did was really just generate this excitement that we really hadn't had before amongst the students. So we were getting all different kinds of students who had never really gotten taken part in the trial up to that point. But once the, the Q code landed, everyone started getting involved. And uh, we had a couple major events, um, 
for instance, we had a couple informational sessions and ice cream socials and really brought students together and kind of got them all into what was going on and what it meant and how to use it. And from our standpoint as a, as a team, it was, the best thing about it was that we were able to hands-on help these students along and show them the process. You know, it, it's one thing for them to read a bulleted list of what to do, but it's another thing to actually walk them through. So that, from our standpoint, I, I found that really rewarding. And uh, on another, from a business standpoint, it, this campaign, more so than anything else, allowed the students to, as David said, experience both sides of the, of the technology for, you know, you, you make the code to achieve these prizes, but you also scan the codes and use the software on your phone to achieve these prizes. And there were many students who were doing both. And as I said, they had never done anything, let alone both. So it really just got everyone involved. And so that was by far my favorite, but the other ones um, were very effective in their own right. The, the Greeny bus shuttle, you would scan it to see, and then it would come up and show you where, how long you're, you're, until your bus arrives, which is what everyone wants to know, obviously. You don't want to wait there any longer than you have to. And it, most of the shuttles here don't have that uh, technology implemented in the, in the waiting area. So we were able to bring that to students, and multiple students voiced that that was their, they found that to be the most effective. They loved it. So that was a really resounding success for us. Um, the magazine drive, as you see in the posters in the back, it was a good way to kick things off, kind of get um, initial excitement. We started at the very beginning before anybody really knew what it was. And so it's very visual, very, uh, you know, obviously something that everyone can relate to. Everyone wants free magazine. Um, and then, as you can see there, we were able to evolve it over time, so it wasn't just a one-stop shop. We were able to keep it going throughout the entire process and generate further interest along the way. Um, the Relay for Life event was overly phenomenal because that was the day where we got a 1,000 scans in a single day, and we were able to show the students that this isn't just about advertising and money. That we like You can put this to so many different causes, so many different cases, and kind of prove to them that, you know, this really is completely boundless, and everybody is willing to jump on board for this great cause of raising money for cancer. Um, and I'm going to have to touch on Facebook as it is mine. Um, it, it was there was a lot of challenges that go with it um, because I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but they they rely strictly on viral spreading of information. Um, but the way we approached it is proves that there's going to be a lot of a, a lot of future effectiveness. Um, we have an application that students can add directly to their profiles called the Codebook, and this shows students what you yourself have been scanning and what your friends have been scanning, and so it shows what's popular, what's cool, and other. And someone's on your profile, they can see the, all the activity that's going on and be and pique their interest, and then have them go scan those codes. So um, there's a great uh, balance there, and we also set up a number of groups and events and pages and just really found that it, it is very effective um, from a viral standpoint and getting getting the message out, getting the Q code message out, and getting students involved. So, um, but again, my favorite was Q code, but all of them were extremely effective, if, if you ask me. Last of our three uh, participants from our MEM teams. And by the way, there was a, a, a dozen students from MEM uh, in two teams with uh, mobile discovery. So we're hearing only a small uh, piece of what was a very extensive uh, level of participation. Uh, on to Ben Rose. Uh, and what's been your favorite part, Ben, of the trial? All right, well, uh, I was one of the guys on the uh, sales and business development team along with my, uh, my partner, Saif. So um, we were responsible for going out and talking to all the people that we needed to, to try to get to help us for this, uh, like the major student groups, uh, like the Observer and um, the University Program Board and groups like that. So I think for me personally, anyway, my, the favorite part of, the, of this trial was um, just getting myself out of my comfort zone of being an engineer and you know doing problems and stuff and actually having to go and talk to people. <laughs> um, so, but so it was it was interesting to uh, to really just kind of see all these di the different parts of it uh, coming together and um, 
a lot of different uh, different groups I didn't really know much about, and uh, all of us had to work with a lot of different parts of, of campus. So I think all of us got something out of it in that, where we, we got to learn more about CASE and about just uh, leveraging the, the context that we already had and the, um, the resources that we already had, because uh, some of us did our undergrads here, so we knew people and organizations. So um, it, was, it was a good exercise in, uh, um, in like a, a business and networking sort of situation, which we don't really get much of in, as engineering undergrads. Um, and then other than that, I, it, was, um, it was, I think it was really interesting, I'm sure I can speak for all of us, just being a part of of launching a, a new product, like you know, we can, Dr. Winnick mentioned, you know, we we he, they lecture in the class and everything, and we, so we can learn about, you know, theoretically how this all should work all you know, all day and all night, but uh, until we, you actually go out and try to do it, uh, I think is when you get a, more of an appreciation of it. So um, it was it was a good educational experience for all of us, uh, and it it got some uh, um, some interest from from really the whole student body because we. A lot of what we'd try to do is tell people what we're doing and why we're doing it, and so they said, "Oh, that sounds pretty cool." And uh, so it wasn't just uh, an advertising thing; it was we're, we were learning something from it too. So th uh, th I think that was my favorite part of the trial, just being able to firsthand experience what a, a product launch is like, and all the all the the effort that goes into it, and all the um, the problems that you'll come up with, and all the 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 things that go really well, and how much fun that is. So, uh, so that was my favorite part. One, one quick comment before we go on to, to Mike. One of the really special things for me throughout this trial was to watch each of the students on the MEM team step up and go above and beyond on an individual basis. And uh, so, for example, NC was one of the two project managers. So he worked to organize the 12 different students and, and help f uh, manage the flow of work and the expectations and the management. And that was a really challenging job. And NC and, and Missy, who's not here today, did a really great job with that. In addition, NC stepped up and, and did you know the, the documents that were passed around earlier, the evolution of codes, without any leadership without me even knowing about it. I just saw it for the first time today. And that's very impressive when students start to step up and do stuff when they're not even told. Um, uh, ben was the first student on the team that I walked through the portal and uh, on his own and he went and created three instructional videos that he then went and put on our Facebook site that Mike was managing so that the other students on the team and other folks around campus could go and learn how to use the portal. Uh, and then Mike, like he mentioned, was the sole owner of, of, of the Facebook side of things. And uh, we had a Facebook group set up for information sharing. And uh, that was something that was really exciting for me was to watch each student in an individual way step up and do things that weren't even assigned or asked of them. Just, you know, watching them, you know, see things that, that could benefit this project and then self-motivate and go do it. And I think it's a really huge pat on the back to the students, the type of students that are in this program. So I just wanted to throw that out there. It kind of came to mind as the students were talking. So I'll pass it off to Mike now. I get the uh, fun job of uh, sharing with you some history. Um, when David uh, and Sprint came to me in August last year, it was kind of like Yogi Berra would say, deja vu all over again. Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, Casey Green, our opening speaker, uh, met with me and brought me one of these. <laughs> this is a QCAT. This is the device that was talked about 10 years ago that quite honestly failed miserably. Um, the way this is, works is it, te it is tethered to your computer and you scan a barcode, and it would then take you to a web page. Um, and I sold these. I've had clients who bought these. It was kind of a perfect storm. Uh, Smithsonian was one of my clients. They came to me and said, we want to do a 25th anniversary of the barcode. Um, and then another client came to me and said, we want more content on the web. But the URL is http colon slash slash backslash, or is it forward slash, uh, www.smithsonian.gov.usmah. It was impossible. So it'd be great to have a small little print piece that you scan a barcode and you get all this enriched content. And we thought, you know what? 
I can do this. And I, I think I sold this to about a dozen different educational organizations. They also made a, a tethered, untethered one. It was a cross pen. Um, and I had one of those, but I've since lost it. But the problem with this is the way that it worked is you registered your cat and you then scanned your barcode and it would down, bounce down to Texas where the servers were, the company was based, and it would record not only where you were going, but who was going there. And they were selling that information. The privacy issues were not good. The other issue that came about with this is that the company insisted that the scanning technology was their intellectual property. And as a result, they started suing people who had hacked the code. Um, that didn't go over real well. And so all of a sudden, the stock went plummeting, um, and these all disappeared. I still think this is a good idea. And so when David came to me and said, hey, look, you can use your cell phone and do this. Uh, the reason they came to me is because I've been wanting to use the cell phone in class. Yes, I encourage people to bring their cell phones to class. Um, and we, with David's help, we developed an application that allows students to actively participate in class using their cell phone. Um, but they said, we want a pedagogical use for this technology. So we've been racking our brains, and we came up with one. And this is what we hinted at earlier. I can give each student a 2D barcode. As a matter of fact, we can print it right on here, on your case ID. And then in class, I can say, OK, it's quiz time. Scan your code. And they can scan their code, and I can send a short quiz direct to their handheld device that's unique to them. The person sitting next to them is going to have a completely different set of questions. I teach intro chemistry. I had 700 students in the fall. So I don't have to worry about the person next to them having the same numbers. I'm going to randomize it. But in addition, I encourage them to work together. So they can sit there, and they can put their heads together and say, oh, let's try this together and see if we can solve it. The intent is that they show what they know, not what they don't know. Um, and so they all carry one of these, they being every 18 to 22-year-old. 99% of all students carry one. Um, and so the fact whether they have it or not is not the question. They do. Um, and so if we can implement this in a classroom to help them understand the material, it's a great thing. So what else is different about it? Sure, my provider knows every phone call that I make. But I've also signed an ex a usage agreement that says they can't share that information with anyone else. The privacy issues have been addressed. Is someone going to hack this code? I hope so. Because every single provider, and really what convinced me that this was a good thing, is that all the providers are working together on this. This isn't going to be one provider having a marketing advantage over another. This is every provider giving access to everyone for this. So I see this as a win-win for everybody. Does it have concerns still? Yeah. Will every single one of my students want to take their quiz on a handheld device? No. But I also know that there's multiple learning modalities, and I'm going to appeal to those that are specific to the individual. I happen to be an early adopter. When this came to me, I convinced my boss this was the greatest thing since sliced bread. She made a lot of money on it, I'll tell you that. Uh, but Casey will tell you that as of a year ago, he still had 1,000 of them in his garage. This one I still had in the package, unopened until yesterday. I finally opened it. I got it from my mother-in-law, actually. She had it in her garage because when I was selling them, she said, oh, I want a couple of those. So I gave her half a dozen. Um, and she kept one, thankfully, because mine's gone. Um, but it's, uh, it is an interesting technology. The one thing about the, this one that was really good is it's ubiquitous. The barcodes that it read were the same barcodes as everything else. And so is this one the same way? Not necessarily, but you know what? I've got a flight today at 4.50, and it's already changed gates once, so I'm going to scan the 2D barcode that's on my boarding pass and find out if it's the same gate. Now, does that case work yet? No. Could it? Absolutely. So if I were to just scan this now, and it would tell me, oh, your gate's been moved yet again. You're now on the D concourse instead of the C concourse, for those familiar with Cleveland. Um, I have a bit of a hike. Uh, luckily, the rapid gets right there quickly. So that's what I have to share with you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Michael. I'll, uh, for the sake of uh, time, I'll be brief in some uh, closing remarks, and then we can open it up for some Q&A. Uh, I'll use my license as moderator to change the title and say the trial in instructor's view. Scientific American did a parody on the discovery of a new element a few years ago called administratium. 
and uh, among its properties, what it was uh, that it's the most dense element in the universe. So I'm, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to pass on that. Uh, from from an instructor's point of view, and again, I've had the privilege of uh, being the co-instructor in product design with these two teams uh, linked to mobile discovery, and. Uh, I tell our students, uh, I, I know how good they are by how much I learn from them, and I mean that sincerely. And one thing I've learned, uh, especially from this trial, is something that uh, textbooks say, but you can't really appreciate, you can't absorb until you're part of it, is that product design is messy. You know, everybody's looking for a road map to do good product design. You generate ideas. Uh, based on some need, either perceived or real, and then you try to down-select a few winners and take those through a prototyping stage, if it's a consumer product, et cetera, uh, and then uh, uh, you know, go to uh, low-level manufacturing or, or small launches, beta trials, and then finally release. And it all looks very linear, but in reality, it's daily feedback loops. It's very, very complicated. And what you assume today to be true in terms of customer wants, uh, for instance, uh, with, uh, and uh, the match between the technology push and the customer pull changes uh, a, a great deal, and it's, it's very dynamic. So uh, I think we all have had a tremendous opportunity to learn in real time product design and development. As uh, David pointed out in one of his slides in an earlier session this morning, uh, a major motivation for the trial was to attempt to link advertiser needs with consumer behavior and acceptance. And I think we've done that successfully. Again, it's not been always smooth, uh, but it's not supposed to be. And it's something that uh, uh, we are all the better for for having experienced it uh, in real time. So I appreciate that uh, again very much. Uh, before opening it up for Q&A, let me just thank the rest of the mobile discovery team, uh, Leanne Barnes, Jennifer Graham, Raj Kaluri uh, in particular, uh, Suzette Williamson, Ramona David from the Time Office, who've been part of this uh, in more ways than one, Arpit uh, Gupta, one of our uh, a dozen students, uh, the remainder of the students who haven't had a chance to make remarks today. Uh, thanks for all the hard work and uh, again uh, for the opportunity to be part of something rather significant. Oh, and I wrote Bob, uh, Bob Sopko, I'm sorry, I, I wrote but forgot. Mm -hmm. He's uh, actually, he's been a, a, such a key player for us, uh, an information technology guru from our Weatherhead School of Management. So thanks again for uh, uh, much advice, as well as a lot of hard work, uh, frequently behind the scenes, but uh, no less important to the success of this trial. So uh, thanks again, and uh, there is uh, some time for some Q&A, so anyone who would like to address any of us uh, here on the panel, except me. Are the phones able to read, uh, do they work with the bar scanners, the codes, do they work with the bar scanners at regular retail? Or is it only through the phone? It's no, it's it's not the traditional 1D codes. Okay. It's 2D barcodes, which are a little bit different. Okay. Uh, the good news is they have more capacity for carrying data, and they're easier for the uh, off-the-shelf phones to read. Most of the uh, grocery store chains and whatnot, in order to read the 2D or the 1D codes, have specialized pieces of hardware, and so the benefit of the 2D codes are they carry more data and they're a little bit easier to read uh, by a lesser uh, piece of hardware. There is a standards body that assigns those, in fact, and, and when the company put these out, they actually hand input everything manually. Uh, so whenever they'd come up with a new code that they didn't know what it was, someone would go, go in and, and enter the information and link to the product manufacturer's website, uh, which is why the company said at one time they had 2,000 employees. I, I love the the boards and the pictures, they're, they're great to kind of show the story. Um, how, one I didn't hear though was how w widely is available is it to get that barcode for themselves? So for instance, um, could any uh, band on the street get a barcode and put it on a postcard that they handed out on the street corners to let everybody know about what their, their concert schedule or something like that? I mean, that's another kind of university environment. So uh, there's two two parts to that question. Number one is the barcode. So can anybody go and create a barcode? Uh, it depends on the type of code. So there are certain codes that are standards-based 
codes, QR code is one in particular, where you can go online and anyone, literally anyone, it's not restricted, people can create them. Uh, there are QR code readers out there that are freely available for download, and if you uh, are on a wireless carrier that uh, allows you know open downloads, you can download that. For the purposes of this trial, we used a proprietary code, and we used a proprietary reader. So for the purpose of this trial, you had to register at the website uh, and essentially prove that you had a case.edu address, and uh, you signed up and you got an email. When you click on the email, a text message was automatically sent to your phone with the with the download, and uh, at the same time, you were uh, you were granted access to the mobile discovery portal for the purposes of creating campaigns and ma making content, managing codes, stuff like that. My question was along the similar lines to that, so you've answered a bit of it, but um, with SEMA codes and QR codes and, and, and this variety of stuff that's out there at the moment, do you see the rise of one application to read all of these, especially with like adoption of iPhones uh, going forward as well? I, I see a future where there's multiple code options and the carriers will mandate uh, that applications on their phone be able to read a couple different types of codes. I, I do believe that that is what the future holds. So now, whether it starts with one and then it builds from there or whether it starts with two or three, you know, vi very uh, interesting uh, to be determined and we're very close to that development and that uh, research effort hand in hand with the carriers. But I, ultimately I think that there you will see multiple code options because you have multiple use cases and some types of codes are better suited to certain use cases and ultimately consumer choice and, and business user choice will determine which is the best code for the use case. I got a question. I got a question for the uh, for the students. Since you were involved uh, on the ground with getting uh, this going with the other students, it was very widely accepted. But for the students that had some resistance to this or some pushback, what were the main things you heard about why they didn't want to do it? Well, I think the biggest one was just the um, the financial aspect of it. How much? I mean, that was almost the first question every time. How much does it cost? How much does it cost for me to scan one? Um, and then we, we alleviated that problem by, pos by putting that information on all our publications, as you can see around. Um, and one, once they realize that, oh, it's you know, free in some cases, but two cents in another case, or depending on which carrier you have, um, once we were able to educate them further on those kind of things, that it helped. Um, but are there any other major ones? No, I think that that's, that's pretty much the primary one. Um, another one was, this is more on a smaller level, but was just uh, usability. Some people wanted to see better applications of the code. Like for instance, one of the favorite ones was the bus shuttle. People really loved that. And they loved a lot of the other ones that we use as well, but um, I guess some of the resistance that we see received from some people was that they wanted to see it everywhere in every single capacity possible. And obviously we can't do that as students. So I guess eventually, I guess we'll appease those people. Like Mike said, the um, just the cost of, of uh, the, the data plan stuff was was probably our biggest hurdle to get past. So. But we, we tried to deal with that by, um, in, that, in, in addition to what Mike said, putting the information there, uh, also trying to make it worth it for someone to, to scan a code. So we had all the promotions of the magazine and the, all of the contests to enter and things like that. That actually brings up a question. Sweepstakes always has to have, one of their primary fundamental rules is that it has to be free in order to be able to enter to win, that there's no cost to anybody. If there's, in fact, a cost to scan because of the time spent on the, you know, through your carrier, was that an issue with the sweepstakes? Was that something you guys looked at, or was it an issue? Uh, I don't have the information to answer that. I'm, I'd have to get back to you if that's all right. I will say that the, the sweepstakes, you know, even if it did cost something, um, we don't have the information to say, but um, I think having the prizes made the students more willing to. Like they didn't, as Ben said, it added more value for them. So, um, you know, for instance, you know, I won a big prize and <laughs> the grand surprise, prize. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> yeah. um, it wasn't fixed, it was completely <laughs> luck. Um, but nonetheless, you know, it was a, it, being able to 
you know, spend a couple cents and in the end get a huge prize was more than worth it. So I think that as students, that those kind of things no pique their is. interest and in take them to it. That's a good point. We had uh, Sprint donated 50 phones. Uh, and so anytime we had an event, we had uh, a plethora of phones available for people who either didn't have their own phone or uh, didn't have a data plan or whatever. Uh, we also loaned phones out on a regular basis to folks so that they could experience uh, the technology and get used to it and stuff and like the, that. And uh, the make it portion as well, which you, where you go online and create the content, that's entirely free. So even if a student doesn't have it on his or her phone, they can still partake in the sweepstakes from the other angle, so. That's right, yeah, that's, that was a good, what we that's a good, that's the answer that I should have had. <laughs> <laughs> um, but why don't you tell them what you won? <laughs> what I won? Yeah. Um, I won a 42-inch uh, TV, which is really awesome and huge. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was well worth all the work I put in. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares about the grade? <laughs> Way through it or near the end that you didn't have time or resources to get to. Um, Go ahead. Cool. Um, working throughout the project, working throughout the project, I, I talked to a, a number of students, and one of the biggest ones was uh, uh, what they called a beacon. Um, this was this came from a CIA student. What he wanted to see was he, he travels in New York a lot, and what he what he wanted to see in Manhattan was uh, some kind of code that was on a light post that would tell you where the next club was, where the taxi was, or where the nearest train was, to basically give you all the information you needed equal distance to that location. And it would have been nice to have something like that on campus to get an idea of lectures and get an idea of where the, also kind of tied directly to the nearest bus shuttle and the time that would get there, as well as some stories that are tied to perhaps Observer or some, something that's big in the forum, that case or anything like that. But I mean, of course, that, wasn't, that was beyond our scope at the time, but it would have been great to see that happen. Was that primarily for the advertisers to get more information about the advertisers? Or how, how was that structured? I can, I can answer that. Um, that was actually um, mostly for just uh, more inf further information on the articles. And uh, um, I worked, uh, uh, one of our team members and I worked uh, pretty closely with uh, Meg, uh, Meg Grady from the, the Observer. And, um, and she was a great help during that whole thing. Um, but it was mostly, uh, you know, you'd re be reading through an article and say you, um, for instance, there was an article about uh, the U.S. News and World Report rankings um, of, the, of colleges. So there was a code you could scan, and you could get the U.S. News rankings on your phone while you're reading the article. So you could look there and see, oh, okay, here's where Casey is, number 37 or whatever it was. And um, so it, was, it, was, it ended up being uh, a lot of the articles, um, we got some of the sources that the, the reporters used. Uh, they were linked to articles throughout the paper. Um, and then there were some constant links, like there was one in the sports section that always linked to the, uh, the Case Athletics website. Um, there was always a link that linked to the Observer's own website. So it was, uh, they changed uh, every week. So it was actually mostly just for extra functionality, more information, a little more interactivity um, on the, associated with the article, so you could go back and um, even in your scan history on your computer, you could go and, and read some of the articles and uh, some of the actual sources for the, the articles. Do you want to talk a bit about the, the uh, interoperability of the scan and then the computer? You just mentioned you could go mm -hmm. back on your computer and... Sure. Um, so one of the, the cool things about the, the portal is that when you scan a code, uh, since you, you have to register your phone when you, when you register at, uh, at the website, um, so you scan a code, it recognizes that it's your phone that scanned that code. Uh, so then not only do you get the, uh, the whatever the mobile content is on your phone right then, you can go back later on your computer, log on, and you see a list of, of all the scans that you've had. And um, one of the things you do when you set up a, a new content uh, a new content page is you associate a mobile URL and you can um, you can associate an external web URL, just a standard web page with it too. So then there's a link in your scan history, you can just click on that link, it'll take you to a website um, with just a, a real web page. And uh, so you can uh, go back and see it later so then you remember what you scanned later and you can just keep uh, interacting with it more and more and keep getting more information. So going back to the newspaper comment, it was very much our goal in the beginning to uh, 
educate um, the, the newspaper staff on the benefits of this technology, not only for increased demand for advertising and increased capability for advertising, but also it will increase the uh, effectiveness of, uh, of, a, of, of an editorial piece. So say uh, you have, as part of a, a, an article, you do an interview with someone but you don't want to put the full transcript in the paper. So, you know, you have your normal article in the paper. You can have a code linked to a full audio file of the whole interview. So you, it allows you to extend. Uh, and essentially, you, you get more real estate than you have on the page. So in, in print, anyone who works in the newspaper will tell you that real estate is an issue. And, you know, configuring a newspaper to make it all fit together is... Uh, kind of like sometimes putting a jigsaw puzzle together. And so what this allows you to do is uh, extend the print ad into the, the digital world. And one of, one of my uh, the other use cases that I, I like from the newspaper is a movie review. And the link is to a movie trailer. So you can read the review, and then you can watch the trailer on your phone. Uh, so I thought that that was a pretty innovative use. Given the time, it's uh, appropriate for us to conclude our session, but I'd, I'd like to do that simply with four thank yous. One to David Miller, CEO and President of Mobile Discovery, for making this possible. And I should acknowledge as part of that Levganic organizer of today's uh, collaboration technology event uh, for facilitating that linkage. Secondly, to our panel, NC, Mike, Mike, and Ben, uh, for participation. Third, to those uh, in the uh, Mobile Discovery launch family that I acknowledged uh, earlier, and uh, as well as our uh, uh, additional MEM students who participated. And fourth, uh, you for uh, uh, attending, uh, being uh, for your attention, as well as participation for a great uh, ending Q&A. So thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of the event.